welcome to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. The global fitness app market is expected to rise to an estimated value of about $13 billion by 2026. This rise in market value can be attributed to the rise of increased disposable income, along with advancements of applicable devices being integrated with enhanced quality of sensors. Earlier this week, Apple announced the latest version of its smartwatch operating system, Watch OS 7, during its digital-only Worldwide Developer Conference keynote. The update comes with some major new additions, like a rebranded activity app that's now called Fitness, Sleep Tracking, alternatively, Google Fit, collaborated with the American Heart Association to develop heart points, an activity goal based on your activity recommendations to show your impact to health. Google Fit also makes it easy to monitor your progress and track your activity right from your phone or smartwatch. In this week's show, we take a look at both the recent announcements from Apple and the Google Fit ecosystem to help you track your personal health and fitness goals. So let's dive in. Apple recently rebranded their activity app and now calls it their fitness app. And this redesigned app provides a much more streamlined view of data, including your daily activity, your workouts, any awards or badges that you might be awarded, and any activity trends on one tab with activity sharing and activity competitions on another. The watch version includes additional workouts that they support like dancing, core functional strength, and even your cool down periods. And just as in iOS 14, Maps on the Apple Watch now has cycling specific directions for your biking workouts. This workout app has been the hub for any kind of workout you can track with the Apple Watch, including running, swimming, rowing, and more. Specifically, those new workout types include core training, dance, functional strength training, and cool down. Dance was highlighted by Apple in their keynote because it can be somewhat tricky to track, but Apple says that it's Apple Watch will use its onboard accelerometer and gyroscope to determine what kind of dance you're doing. Specifically, if you're moving your arms, your legs, or both, so whether you're doing hip hop dances, Latin, different Bollywood, or cardio dance, they'll be able to track it and see what you're moving, whether it's your arms or legs or both. And this allows it to more accurately track the amount of calories you burn while you are dancing. The workout app also gets new options for tracking core training, functional strength training, and cool downs. So you get an accurate picture of how many calories you burn during a workout where you make fewer or slower movements than you would with either a cardiovascular exercise like running or biking. Another announcement by Apple was the hearing health. Now, following the introduction of the Noise app in Watch iOS 6 that measures the ambient sound levels and duration of exposure, this new operating system, Watch OS 7, adds further support for hearing health with headphone audio notifications. So customers can now understand how loudly they are listening to media through their headphones using their iPhone and or Apple Watch when these levels may impact hearing over time. So what happens is, when total listening time with your headphones has reached 100% of the, quote, safe weekly listening amount, Apple provides a notification to the user. And again, this threshold is based on World Health Organization recommendations that, as an example, a person can be exposed to 80 decibels for about 40 hours a week without any impact to hearing abilities. So, customers can see how long they've been exposed to high decibel levels each week in the health app on the iPhone and can control the maximum level for headphone volume. No audio from the headphone audio notification feature is recorded or saved by the health app or Apple Watch, but just a nice notification to protect your hearing. Apple also introduced a sleep tracker. Sleep tracking is probably one of the most requested features since Apple Watch first came out. And the native sleep tracking feature will let you set a bedtime and wake up alarm using the existing Apple Watch vibration alarm. And Apple calls this holistic sleep tracking for the Apple Watch that not only helps users track their average time sleeping in bed and average time actually asleep, but also 
help them get into a pre-bedtime routine. So this feature is called wind down and wind down mode will work in tandem with the iPhone to enable a series of app shortcuts for snoozing notifications, setting maybe an Apple music playlist, turning on a meditation app, activating a smart home preset to dim lights, things of that nature. So using the Apple Watch as a sleep tracking device does mean that you'll have to charge it at some point during the day. And of course, Apple Watch users will be able to either set that vibration, those haptic alarms, or they could optionally wake up to gentle sounds. And apparently it would not be a 2020 release without including some nod to the pandemic. And in this case, we have a feature called hand washing detection. So this is again tailored for the pandemic. It knows when you start washing your hands by using both motion sensors and the audio from the background running water. So it's pretty clever. And that kicks off a countdown to tell you how long to keep washing your hands to match the amount of time recommended by health officials. While both an audio and a haptic notification will let you know when to stop. So you can just feel the watch vibrate when the 20 second countdown timer is up. The innovative thing here from Apple, there are other smartwatches that do allow hand washing modes in their, in their watches, but you have to manually kick those off. So the innovative thing that Apple has done here is it automatically detects the process of hand washing. We'll see how accurate it is when it comes out, but the motion sensors in the watch and the microphone detecting the sound of running water make it pretty clever to start off the 20 second countdown. Now, what happens if you finish before the 20 seconds are up? Well, the watch will prompt you to get back to hand washing. <laughs> You're not done. Your hand washing history also can be found within the health app, which can potentially help you form a new habit. Once you start tracking something and being diligent about it, it starts to form a new habit. Again, not a particularly complex tool, but it could be helpful if you're having trouble washing your hands for long enough, or you just need to be gently reminded to do so. And always of note, when you're talking about health and fitness data, be remiss if you didn't mention privacy. Privacy is pretty fundamental to Apple and obviously particularly important when it comes to health data. So all the health features are designed with privacy in mind. Apple reminds us that all the health data is encrypted on the device, also encrypted in iCloud or iCloud Sync, which depending on which one you use and where that information goes, where what happens to that information is always under the user's control. So Apple definitely taking a strong stance here on privacy, and that's applauded, especially when it comes to health data. So pricing and availability of the new Apple Watch and WatchOS 7. Pricing starts at $399 up to about $799, depending on how you bedazzle your watch with different bands and faces and things of that nature. This is for the Series 5 Apple Watch. Current availability is slated for fall of 2020. And the new Watch OS 7 does require at least a pairing device of an iPhone 6S or later with iOS 14 or later. Not a surprise, pushing that upgrade cycle, that's what Apple does so well. Shifting gears to the Android platform, Google Fit approaches things a little differently than other fitness apps. Now you can still check on all the common metrics like your heart rate, step count, but Google Fit combines your activity metrics to make them mean something a little bit more. To do this, Google worked with the American Heart Association to create two goals. They're trying to simplify things for the user. So they created two goals based on the Heart Association's activity recommendations, and they called these move minutes and heart points. So move minutes is really a way to measure your active time. You earn move minutes for every bit of physical activity you do, including walking, running, swimming, yoga, anything you do where your body is not sedentary counts toward your active move minutes. Heart points are earned when you perform activities at a higher pace. So you earn a heart point for, as an example, per minute of moderately intense exercise like a swift walk or a treadmill walk on an incline. You can also earn double heart points if you're taking part in much more intensive activities 
like a long run or jumping rope. And again, Google's goal with the simplification of move minutes and heart points is really to try to make the results of exercising much more easier to understand, to simplify everything, keep it really, really simple. And it's a different approach than other fitness apps that may overwhelm you with data and number and charts and graphs and trends, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means it might be a simpler way to get certain people into and understanding the very basics of a fitness app for everyone. But don't let its simplicity fool you from thinking that it's not a full functioning app. There's a lot of things you can do with Google Fit. You can track your workouts from your phone or your watch. You can get insights when you exercise, see real-time stats for your walks, runs, bike rides. It will use your Android phone sensors or your Wear OS by Google Smartwatch's heart rate sensors to record your speed, your pace, your route, and more. It also has tracking tools built in so you can monitor your progress toward your goals. You can see your daily progress on your heart points and your move minutes and steps. So if you walk or run or bike throughout the day, your Android phone or your Wear OS smartwatch will automatically detect and add your activities to your Google Fit journal to ensure that you get credit for all the time you're actually moving. But if you have a different type of workout, I do weight resistance training in the middle of the day. You just select it from a list of activities and they have a long list of activities. One thing I was pretty impressed with Google Fit is the plethora of activities that it has from Pilates to weight training, spinning, rowing. You can select from whatever, fill out the short drop downs and Google Fit will track all the heart points and move points that you earn by doing those exercises. The other nice thing is if you do something consistently, it, it always appears at the top of the list. So you can just quickly select it. So when I do my fasted cardio for 45 minutes in the morning, it's already there. I just have to click on it, tap on it. Good to go. Google Fit also connects with a lot of other apps and other devices. So it can show you information pull in information from many of your other favorite health and fitness apps and devices to give you a much more holistic view of your health so you never lose track of your progress. There are a ton of apps that are compatible with Google Fit from Nike Plus, RunKeeper, MyFitnessPal, all the Wear OS devices, tons. You have to go on their website and check it out. Part of Google's strategy is to have Google Fit be its own app but you might want to connect it with other fitness apps for a variety of reasons. Let's say you use a Garmin device for tracking your workouts through an app like Runtastic, but you love Google Fit's simplicity of move minutes and heart points. You can easily connect Google Fit to Runtastic and the fitness data automatically transfers over to Google Fit. So even if you have another device and you love the app, you might want to sync it with Google Fit just to have everything in one place. It still allows you to use those other apps like Runtastic, but it also gives you that summary of all of your fitness inside Google Fit. You can also schedule recurring exercises with Google Fit through Google Calendar, which is kind of interesting. If you're a Google Calendar junkie like me, you can just open Google Calendar tap on exercise and you can choose which exercises you want to schedule and how often you like that exercise to reoccur just like any other calendar appointment duration what time of day you want to exercise so this is a great way to make sure that you're integrating your fitness and workout into your daily calendar and schedule while apple is notorious for having great and seamless integration between a singular apple watch and the iphone google of course choosing a different path so it has a multitude of devices that are compatible with Google Fit. And the operating system that is compatible is called Wear OS. And Google Fit is the default fitness app for Wear OS devices, unless a company, of course, includes their own fitness app. So you can easily use Google Fit if you have a Wear OS smartwatch, as an example. And in the Wear OS smartwatch category, it's still undergoing an evolution. The early watches, smart watches, were from tech companies like Motorola, LG, and that's now evolving to much more fashion brands, companies like Fossil, Sunto, Moto, 
who are evolving the fashion forward nature of the watch with the technicality of the Wear OS operating system. So while some of the core strengths of Google Fit are in its simplicity and its broad ecosystem, it does have a few shortcomings. One is the lack of any kind of social platform. There's not really a big community aspect to Google Fit. No real ability to kind of post status updates, photos, comments, maybe get advice from more of a community, fitness-based community. None of that really is in Google Fit. Similarly, it doesn't really offer any training programs. That one to me, not as critical, but might be worth mentioning as an adjunct feature down the road. Also, Google Fit doesn't provide any tracking for food or water intake. It'd be nice to do that even if you imported it from my fitness pal to just store, even if it was a simple calorie intake, so you could kind of sync up calories with exercise as you're looking at your overall health picture. Overall, Google Fit is a solid start, which could evolve certainly into a much more powerful fitness application and platform. The interface is simple, it's clean. I'll put some screenshots on the website at www.fitterist.com forward slash 067 for episode 67 of The Fitterist Show. But its simplicity and its movement, its heart points are just useful metrics that should help in their simplicity just people getting started with tracking some element of their overall health. So in summary, both Apple and Google offer evolving solutions to help one with the overall health and fitness tracking. Now remember, with all of this fitness tracking from an increasing number of apps in the ecosystem, there's a lot of data that needs to be aggregated and consolidated where consumers can look and analyze their own health trends. Usually, this data is spread across a bunch of different apps, different tools, different locations, and making it more complicated. But in this case, both Google Fit and Apple offer viable solutions. They address the issue of consolidating the data and making it mobile and accessible, and each offer different advantages on their platforms as well. Both Google and Apple's apps can be used as a phone-based fitness tracker where it tracks the basic fitness elements, i.e. there's no need for any separate wearable technology to do the tracking. It uses the accelerometer, the GPS, and other sensors in the phones where both apps keep tabs on kind of the baseline and standard activity. They also easily can track height, weight, and the type of activity one is participating in, the time, the distance, how consistent they are, the number of steps that have been taken, the elevation that has been climbed, calories burned. There's a lot that they can do just with the phone. But when paired with a third-party app or a wearable, like a smartwatch, the health tracking becomes much more comprehensive. It allows other data that can't just be measured on a simple smartphone. Thus, it gives the user a more well-rounded view of one's overall current health. In an extension here, and Apple probably has a little bit of the lead here as they've been thinking about it a little bit more, but allowing the user to make that health data available to individuals, i.e. think doctors, and institutions that can provide care so it's a much more holistic, objective set of data that one could share with their doctor around their overall picture of their health. With both Apple and Google offering apps, tools, and a platform to allow one to track and manage some of the basic health and fitness metrics, it's overall it's a good thing for consumers. Continuing to evolve and develop this ecosystem where third-party apps and devices can accurately measure and contribute data to one's overall health profile just makes health and fitness that much more accessible. Automating this data collection and presenting it to the user continually reinforce key health and fitness indicators that can serve as a prompt for the user to take action. And action can move those objective metrics to just healthier levels. And that's a good thing. Thanks for joining me this week. We'll talk to you next week. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. 
You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterist Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterist Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterist Show. My name is Christopher Allen, and make it a magical day.